Good morning. I want us to reflect on the sounds of children who will praise the Lord in their way. I want us to reflect on God's love this morning. And I was thinking of Romans 8, where the Apostle Paul tells us If God is for us, who can be against us? And he says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And then towards the end of, of uh, the, 30, uh, the, the eighth chapter, he says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I think that's something that we can bank on, that nothing, absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. So wherever you're at today, just keep that in mind, that God loves you and longs for a intimate relationship with you. Let me read that in Armenian also. Ureme nici să încas panerun hamarete asfalt mer gomne o vidă la mezi hagarag. An vorir vor tinci chnaie tsaba mer amerun hamar matnet zaniga al inchpes anor het polor paner mezi chi bar kever. Pasen zi yes hastat ki dem te voch maha voch gyanke voch reshtak nere voch ishkanu chunere. Voch zoru chunere voch nerga panere voch kalu panere voch parsu chuna voch khorungutune ye voch urish ararats gnamez zadel astuzo seren vor christos hisus mer deroch move awatank let us pray our father we have come before you to worship you and we worship you because you are worthy of our worship you are the creator god who holds all things in his hands you are all powerful all knowing all wise And in spite of our sin, you still love us, and nothing can separate us from your love that is in Christ Jesus. So help us, Lord, to come a little closer to understanding that today. As we worship you and praise your name, may you be glorified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, dear church family. Parilus Sireliner. I say no border in the stale dead. Tanzang, yer king, yer burak hanang. This is the day that God created. Let's rejoice and let's reunite our voices in uh, singing praises, exalt his name. <laughs>
let's joyfully adore our Lord who fills our hearts with um, thankfulness and gratefulness. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. Oh, my soul, praise Him for He is thy health and salvation. So gently sustain Has thou not seen How thy desires have been Granted in what he ordained Praise to the Lord who doth prosper Thy work and defend Surely his goodness and mercy here daily attend thee. Ponder on you what the Almighty can do if with his love he be Great is the Lord, he is holy and just, by his power we trust in his love. Great is the Lord, he is faithful and true, by his mercy he proves his love. Great is the Lord, and worthy of glory, great is the Lord, and worthy of praise. Great is the Lord, now lift up your voice, now lift up your voice. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Nedestunde surpe vartarasvat. to have our installation of our officers in a few minutes I wanted to spend some time in prayer first our hearts are very heavy with all kinds of things going on in our lives and around us and so we want to take a few moments uh, in prayer uh, we want to pray for the Der Manuelian family um, you have heard that uh, Christopher has passed away last Sunday evening only about three weeks after his wife did. 
And so we're going to have his funeral service this coming Saturday uh, at 1 o'clock in San Mateo. If you are interested to be there, uh, Marine will have the uh, particulars and you can ask her for it. Um, so we want to pray for their family. We also want to pray for uh, Ukraine um, with the war that's going on. I heard a couple of very interesting things about it. Number one, I heard that there are 100,000 or over 100,000 Armenians living in the Ukraine. And so we want to pray for their protection. We also want to pray for the protection of all our brothers and sisters in Christ, both in the Ukraine as well as uh, in Russia. Um, with, uh, I'm sure they're praying for their governments and their safety, and so we want to join them. The scriptures tell us that if there's anyone hurting in the body of Christ, then the other members of the body also hurt. And so we want to pray that uh, as we experience that pain along with them, that God would uh, comfort them and strengthen them. Um, we, I also found out that Ukraine is one of the most, how should I put this, most sending missionaries in the world. They send a lot of missionaries throughout the four corners of the world. And so that's something exciting about them. And so we want to pray for their families who, who are there. We also want to pray for Matt Silverman. Um, his, his situation has been fluctuating the last several days, as you may know. Um, things weren't looking good yesterday. Things are looking better today. Things weren't looking good uh, four days ago. They were looking better the next day. And so this is quite a roller coaster for him as well as for his family. And so we want to pray that God would continue to put his healing hand on him. And uh, we're glad that his blood count, are, the numbers look good today, and he feels a little better. So let's see what God has in store for him. So let us bow, bow our heads in prayer. Our Father, we come to you with a heavy heart today, with all that's going on around us in the world and in our church family. Uh, we remember today that we have no one else to turn to but you because you are the creator of all things you hold all things in your hands you are the one who has numbered our days every one of us and so there are no surprises for you uh, you are the god who is gracious who is merciful and uh, so we seek your comfort today and we pray lord that um your healing hand would be upon all those who are hurting today. Father, we praise you for your holiness and we praise you for your sovereignty. You are all wise. And so um, sometimes our finite minds cannot come even close to understanding your infinite wisdom. And yet, Lord, you allow us to come to your throne of grace and to pour out our hearts to lift our burdens off of our shoulders and put it into your hands. And thank you, Lord, for giving us that privilege. And yet, at the same time, Lord, we confess that many times we make our demands, and when you give it, we like it and we praise you, and when you don't give it, we turn our backs on you. So, Lord, I pray that you would forgive us our sins and our weaknesses and you would strengthen us by the knowledge of your word that we would be wise to come to you to confess to request and to be thankful we want to pray for the war that's going on in ukraine and we know that this is something evil that russia is doing particularly its president putin and so we ask that you would humble him first of all and all those in his cabinet who are for this war, that there would no longer be any destruction of innocent lives and, and uh, Ukraine would be safe. So I pray for peace, Lord. And I pray that you would protect our brothers and sisters, Armenians and Christians. Father, I pray for Matt. Lord, I thank you for all those who love him and are mindful of his situation and are in prayer for him every day. Thank you for the impact he has had on our lives and for 
the servant, the faithful servant that he has been to you. And so, Lord, we come to your throne of grace and we ask for that grace to be on him and on us. We pray, Lord, that he would sense your presence at this time in the hospital, especially when he's alone and he's not allowed visitors. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would communicate your love in new ways to him. I pray for his mom and dad, Joel and Anna. I pray for his siblings. I pray that you would give them peace and allow them all to turn their eyes to you, Lord, because you are the source of life and eternal life. And I pray for our congregation, Lord, that we would continue to pray and that we would not only pray when we're in dire need, but we would be praying people at all times. So I want to pray for the Dermon William family as they have lost their both mom and dad in a short time. And I pray that you would comfort them and strengthen them and that they would know you as their Lord and Savior. And so we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite all the officers to come up here so we can uh, install you and pray for you. We want to thank all our officers, both past and present, who have served the Lord so faithfully. And so I want to read the names of those who um, are serving at this time. And um, uh, if, if you would just come up here, please, and, and I will pray for you. And we'll go over the questions and answers for your uh, uh, profession of faith. So our new moderator will be Ara Kulukian. Ara, if you would come up here. And Caroline Schofield is our clerk. Our treasurer is Claude Khouri. Uh, and our council members are Margaret Shamblian. She did say she would not be able to make it today. Lina Barsoyan is here. Ari Ekmekji is out of town. Alek Ilesirian is here. Uh, Rosalie Kalabjian is here, and Philip Shamlian is here. So if you would come up here, please. And then we also want to invite our deacons. Uh, we have Rafi Balabanian, Nanor Sadakian, Lara Khuri, and Carolyn Sagarian. If you would come up, please. And as they come up, I want to thank those who completed their term, and in particularly Aren Balabanian and Matt Silverman completed their term in serving as deacons. And so I'm so glad that you have accepted to serve the Lord in this capacity. And we as a congregation want to be faithful in praying for you. And so um, uh, we want to be sure to have a good picture taken. <laughs> but also maybe we can uh, line up in two rows a little later so that uh, uh, that'll be easier on the photographer. But if you uh, follow with me, and we have this on our, um, um, on our screen. And so, um, in the service of installation, I want to read some scripture that Jesus tells us. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve and to give, give his life a ransom for many. So Jesus is our example to follow in not wanting to be served, but we're here to serve him and his people. And then uh, in Romans we read, And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them accordingly, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in, in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. And then finally, in Colossians 3, we read, And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Uh, I have a set of questions first to the deacons. And so if your answer is yes, please say it is. Uh, so the question is, is it your testimony that you have received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? And do you promise to strive to live in obedience to him and in accordance with the biblical requirements of deacons 
that you may honor Jesus by your life and live as an example to others. If so, say, I do. And uh, do you promise in the presence of this congregation to accept the responsibilities of the office of deacon in this church and to the best of your knowledge and ability to discharge all the duties of this office? If so, please say, I do. I do. And uh, the next set of questions is to the council members. Is it your testimony that you have received Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord? If so, say it is. And do you promise to strive to live in obedience to the teaching of Scripture that you may honor Jesus with your life? And do you promise to accept the responsibilities of a council member of this church and to the best of your knowledge and ability to discharge all the duties of this office, encouraging and exhorting the church to follow the head of the church, Jesus Christ, in the doing of his will? If so, please say, I do. And I have a question to you, the church. Um, do you, members of this congregation, acknowledge the candidates as deacons and church council members? Do you promise to encourage and pray for them in their office and to cooperate with them in the fulfillment of the mission of the church? If so, please indicate your yes by standing. Thank you. And if we would all stand, please, and I want to pray for our officers and maybe you can uh, extend your hands as if you're laying your hands on them as I pray for them. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our officers who have agreed to serve this church and the members here. Thank you, Lord, for their faith in Jesus Christ, for their love for you, and for their love for your church. And so I dedicate them to you, and I pray that you would protect them from the evil one. I pray that they would walk with you closely every day and listen to your still small voice so that they would be encouraged to do what you called them to do. And I pray that you would give them divine wisdom as they deliberate and make important decisions for the church. I pray that you would renew our vision so that we would bring honor and glory to your name and we would build your church. I know that you love each one of them, Lord, and I pray that you would fill each one of them with your spirit. And thank you, Lord, for our congregation, for all those who have agreed to love them, to serve them, to encourage them, and to pray for them. And I pray, Lord, that you would make us all faithful and help us to be a light in this dark world, in this corner of the world. And so we pray these things in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you.
I forgot to pray for John Kerkesian, and so I'll do that in a minute. Um, he's been in the hospital for a while uh, with COVID symptoms, but he's much better. Uh, his uh, oxygen levels had to go up, and they did, and uh, they're just waiting for him to be just a little stronger to be able to stand up and walk around, and so he's hoping that he might be discharged today or, or tomorrow. So. We want to pray for him. Just a couple of announcements. Uh, our Bible studies are almost uh, done. Uh, so we've got one or two weeks left. And our Sunday school kids are uh, dismissed now. If uh, you follow your teachers, go, go downstairs. And, uh, uh, and our young people can be dismissed also. And you can go down with Sona uh, Bekmezian. All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for being present here today with us. And thank you that you've given us the Holy Spirit who will speak to us and help us understand your will and your word for us. And we especially want to thank you for your grace in spite of how we have gone astray. And so I pray that you would help us find our way back to paradise. We do want to pray for John and Anahid Kerkesian. I pray, Lord, that your healing hand would be on John and make him stronger. And may your grace sustain him, Lord, and send him home to his wife soon. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We, as human beings, seem to do a wonderful job in um, messing up the gifts that God gives us. And relationships is one of them, isn't it? I mean, just take a look at our examples. A husband and wife, they fall in love, they get married, and within years, months, or weeks, we're at each other's throats, and uh, we fail to communicate with each other properly, we fail to show grace to one another, and we are in competition with one another rather than being on the same team, working on this, uh, for the same thing. Same thing with other relationships, whether it's our relationships with parents and children, uh, it starts great and then all of a sudden it turns ugly. Uh, relationship with uh, siblings, uh, relationship uh, with uh, employer and employee, uh, among the co-workers at work, uh, even friends, close friends, even brothers and sisters in the church. Uh, we love one another one minute, the next minute we're gossiping about each other and, and, and we're destroying the wonderful gift that God has given us. What's the problem with us? Why do we do this? Obviously, we have a sin problem and we need to deal with that. And so as we look at uh, uh, a real brief uh, review of what we've talked about, we saw that in chapter 2, we saw man had total transparency and harmony with God, with his wife, and that means with one another, and then also with nature. Everything was going great. And then what happened? God was prepared to risk giving man the freedom to choose and the freedom to not trust God. And that was the doorway to being banished from the presence of God when man chose that path. And so we know that it was during that temptation that Satan attacked God's word, his authority, and he also attacked God's character, God's goodness, when he approached Eve with his questions that put doubt in her mind about who God was. And so as a result, she sinned, she ate from that fruit, and she also gave it to her husband, and he ate from the fruit. And what was the result? It was man's sin, which was spiritual death, which meant alienation from God, from his wife, and from nature. And that's what we will see today. Everything was corrupted and in need of redemption. When at first 
Uh, God's, hearing God's voice was a delight to Adam and Eve when God would come into the garden in the cool of the day to talk to them and they would be delighted to hear his voice and to have fellowship with him. And now God's voice became a dread. When God came into the garden that he would want to talk to them, what did they do? They hid from God. They did not want to see God because they knew that they were guilty and they were ashamed and afraid. So let's see what God did. If you have your Bibles, please turn to uh, Genesis chapter 3, or you can follow on the screen. As I've always said, bring your Bible to church and take notes. That way you'll remember a little more than 10% of what you hear. Let me read to you Genesis chapter 3, starting with verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree, about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. You will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. What do we see here? We see the anatomy of estrangement. What was a blessing became a curse. What was a blessing? It was a gift of freedom, vitality, life, creativity, and fellowship in the garden with God. And now as we read, starting with verse 14, we see the curse and the judgment. It is bondage, toil, alienation outside the gate on the east side of the garden, and death. And so when God saw what happened, he cursed the ground and he cursed the serpent. But he didn't stop there. We see several things as a result of this curse and the judgment. First of all, we see the complementary complementarity becomes subordination between husband and wife. In chapter 2, we saw that husband and wife were equals. God had created them both in his image, and they were the opposite of the other. They were the counterpart of the other, and they were equals with one another. But in chapter 3, we see male dominance and female subordination. And this is what, the God, what God said to the woman. God said, your desire will be your, for your husband, and he will rule over you. The woman will want to dominate her husband. And in so doing, she will manipulate him so that he will, she will have her way. And yet, God says, he will rule over you. But here's something very important for us to keep in mind. And don't miss this. This is not a divine prescription of what should be, but a description in the fallen world of what will be. This is not a divine prescription of what should be, 
but it is a description of what will be, and this is the consequence of sin. It is at this point that man gives his wife a name. He names her Eve. And we've got to remember that that is one way of dominating because that was his responsibility in naming the animals in chapter 2 to show his dominance over them. And now he shows his dominance over her by naming her Eve. But there's something that good comes from that. And we know that the uh, gospel of Jesus Christ revolutionized all this. As we go back in history and see what happens in the uh, olden times, particularly in the Roman times and even later, we see that women were considered property. But Jesus changed all that. He elevated their status. He gave them dignity. He, he looked them at them as equals. He gave them responsibilities. And so we see how Jesus changed all that. And so that's why we go back and say this is not a prescription of what God said things should be from now on, but it's the result or the consequence of sin, and that is why they've fallen into it. And so when we look at Ephesians chapter 5, for example, where the Apostle Paul is talking to the church about the husband and wife relationship, we see that it begins with mutual submission. They're both submitting to one another. And then there is a responsibility, a role for each one to play. The role of the husband is to be the head of the house. And following the example of Jesus, who gave his life for his wife, so it's being the head of the house means that, the, the head of the woman means that he is to give her life, he is to encourage her, he is to uh, help her reach her potential. And in so doing is when the wife is asked to submit to his leadership, just as the church would submit to the leadership of of uh, Jesus Christ. And so when we do what the scripture is teaching us, then we are reversing the curse in Eden, where man is no longer dominating the woman and the woman is no longer being a subordinate, but they're coming back to be equal to submit to one another. And this reflects the pattern of Christ. We also see that. Um, Work becomes toil. Um, prior to the fall of man, prior to sin, man was supposed to be working. So work in itself is not a punishment, but it is something good. He could be creative. He, uh, it was easy for him to work the ground. But when man fell, when man sinned, things change, and that was the curse, when God cursed the ground. And so this is what we read in Scripture. God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field by the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. And so when we work, when we go to work, when we eat our food with the sweat of our brow, we are reminded of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And so we recognize that when we look to work to satisfy us, we're never satisfied. Even the wealthiest of people say they're always longing for something more, something else. They're never satisfied with what they have. And that is the curse that God brought about for mankind. What happened to the woman? We see that um, in the woman's case, she will have a hard time having children or, or the, it'll be the childbirth, uh, the pains in the childbirth. So it says, and to the woman, God said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe and painful labor you will give birth to children. And so what is to be a delight in bringing life into this world now is going to be miserable. And so for both husband and wife, they will experience this misery. Let's move on to the next thing of what happened as far as the curse and the punishment is that fellowship becomes 
banishment. God used to come to the garden to fellowship with man. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, he came to the garden and he said, where are you? And that was a sign of his longing for that fellowship that he had with them. And yet because they had sinned, they were hiding from God, they were hiding from one another, and so they didn't want to face God. And so what did God say to them? He said, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. Man was no longer welcome in the garden into the presence of God. So man was banished. He had already lost that relationship with his wife and now he lost that relationship with God. There is no longer that relationship. He's, he can't be in the presence of God because of his sin. And God put the cherubim at the gate uh, to the east of the garden so that they would not allow man to come back into the presence of God. And so man was in the world without God. And finally, we come to what life becomes and which is death. And God said, when you eat from it, you will certainly die. This is what God had said. If you eat from that one tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you will certainly die. What was the result? Adam lived till he was 930 years old, so he didn't die right away. So obviously death meant something else as well, because eventually he did die. But death also meant that there would be no fellowship with God, that there would be a curse, that, there, that, there, that things would change. And so once again, we see that the blessing turned into a curse and the way back to the, to the presence of God was blocked. Now, when Adam and Eve had sinned, God came to them and he asked them two very important questions. What was the first one? Where are you? Now, obviously, God knew exactly where they were, right? But he's asking them, where are you spiritually? Where are you in your relationship with me? Where did you go? He wanted man to reflect on that and gave man the possibility of confessing, of repenting. But obviously we know that all they did was blame each other, blame God for what happened. But there was a second question, that was, who told you that you were naked? And the idea behind it is, who were you listening to? In a sense, why were you listening to someone besides me who told you lies? That you would be like God, that you would uh, certainly not die. And so when you think about that question, who were you listening to and, and why in a sense, there seems to be an underlying third question that is implied and is not written here. And that third question is, what do you long for that you ate from the forbidden tree? And as God looks at us, he's asking the same question. What do you long for that you go after other things besides God to satisfy that inner need that you have, that emptiness that you have? If we dig deep in our own lives, we will discover that we long for God's grace because we long for intimate fellowship with God. He has all the answers. He has all the good things, all the good gifts to give us, and we long for that. And so as we look at this passage once again, we understand that God has shown us his grace through this passage. Even though it's a passage full of God's curses and judgments, in all these steps we see God's grace. What are God's provision of grace? Let's take a look at the first one. By the way, grace basically means a gift to the undeserving. A gift to the undeserving. So what happened with Adam and Eve? 
There was a judgment on them. And the judgment was that they would experience pain. He would experience hardship in, in uh, working the ground or in whatever job he does. And uh, she would experience pain in childbirth. But the idea behind it is that there would be a lack of satisfaction, a lack of contentment. They're always longing for something else, for something more. They're never satisfied. We are never satisfied. And so hidden in this, we see God's grace, that that dissatisfaction will lead us to God to meet our need. When we are totally dissatisfied, and as the author of Ecclesiastes says, I tried everything and everything was vanity until I tried God. And so the idea is that when we're dissatisfied because of the judgment, then that's going to lead us back to God who will meet our need. This is what Augustine has said. Our heart is restless until it rests in you. Our hearts are restless without God. We're always looking for something else. We're always wanting something else. We're longing for this, and God has the answer for us if we have that intimate relationship with Him. And so, hidden in this judgment, we see God's grace. And the second one is the covering of guilt and shame. So when God came to them and He saw them cover, covering themselves with fig leaves, that pathetic-looking thing that's going to dry up and fall off, what does God do? He slaughters an animal to take the skin to make coverings for their shame. And this is symbolic of the covering of the blood of Jesus of our sins. And so what God is saying here that he takes our sin so seriously that a life had to be taken in order to give us life. Our sin is so serious that life had to be taken in order to give us life. So God took the life of the animal in order to give them a covering. And that is pointing forward not only to, to the person of Jesus Christ to be a covering for them through his blood, but also for us to know that we have that covering even now. That as we look to him for that covering, it's there for us if we take it. And that is where we see God's grace. Third, we have the banished with a purpose. The garden where Adam and Eve were was God's holy space. God's holy space. And when they sinned, they could not live in the presence of God. The only way that you and I can be in the presence of God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. When we ask for forgiveness and we are forgiven for our sins and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sins. Only then are we qualified to be able to stand before God and to pray to him and to talk to him. And so the, the garden was a, the space for God and they were there and they could not be there. But there's another thing that's good there. And that is God said if they stay in the garden they're going to eat from the tree of life and they will live forever. Now Living forever in a broken world, in, a, in your sin, is hell on earth. And so that is why God pushed them out, banished them, so that they would sense what life is like without God and would long for that fellowship with God one more time. What did he do? He put the cherubim at the east of the garden to block the way for them not to be able to come back in. Now what's interesting is this. When God commanded them to build a temple, the temple was divided into three parts and the inner part was called the Holy of Holies, which had a veil in front of it to keep everybody away from the presence of God. Only the high priest could go into the presence of God once a year after he went through all the rituals of cleansing himself and he would be able to go into the presence of God to represent the people. On that veil was embroidered the picture of cherubim with flaming swords. Do you remember what happened when Jesus died on the cross? That veil tore in half, opening the way for mankind to be in the presence of God one more time. 
And so when God banished them out of the garden, that was his grace so that he would open the way through the cross of Jesus Christ for us to be in the presence of God again, to be able to be in the presence of God one more time. And finally, we have the last part, and that is the naming of Eve. Eve means life, life giver, the mother of all the living. What do we see here? We see that God does not abandon, but offers us life. He said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. Her offspring will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And this is the first mention of the gospel of Jesus Christ in the, in the Bible. That Satan's offspring would be successful in, in striking the heel of the offspring of the woman referring to Jesus. In other words, referring to the fact that Jesus would die on the cross. But when Jesus rose from the dead, that meant he would crush the head of Satan so that Satan no longer has any power over death, over our lives, if we are in Christ. And so this is the very first mention of the gospel, which is God's grace saying, even now I know what's going to happen and you're going to be winners if you are in Christ. And so... The grace that God is showing us here is that the seed of the woman would continue. It's not going to die right there, but it will continue until the time of Jesus when he will be allowed to be crucified, but he will crush the head of Satan so that Satan will no longer have power over us to kill us for eternity if we are in Christ. And so seeing all the grace that God offers us here, I want to ask this question to end. What do you long for? What do you long for? Sin has devastated us and left us lacking. Only God can fulfill your need and give you the satisfaction that you need. Do you long for that intimate fellowship with God, the gift that God wants to give you, is, which is what he gave when he first created mankind? Let us bow our heads. Father, we want to thank you for your gift of life and for your gift of eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that you did not abandon us, that you did not walk away, but you came back. You moved in. You came closer. And you continue to get our attention. Father, we are grateful for this gift that you offer us today. That when we long for you, you meet our need and you satisfy us. And so I want to pray for our congregation. I thank you for all those who know you as their Savior. And experience that satisfaction. And Lord, there might be people here who don't know you as their Lord and Savior. That they've heard about you, but would prefer to cover themselves, to hide from you. And so Lord, we know that we cannot hide from you. You know us full well. And so I pray that you would give us the grace to humble ourselves before you, to bend the knee before you and say, Lord, forgive me. I want that abundant life and eternal life. Thank you, Lord, that you satisfy our longing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all stand and sing the Lord's Prayer, the Hyde Mirror, together.
Zikoyar Kaichun, Yev Zoruchun, Yev Park, Havidian Savidenitz. Amen. You may be seated. If you don't understand Armenian, I would encourage you to read this passage, Numbers 21, and meditate on these verses uh, to give you a different picture of what we just talked about. Kidenk for Israeli Jovurt. Nachendretz chivas tahil astudzo, yet for as far as the rents hostatial yer gira perav, Vacht Sanjo of Urten, yev chivas tahets an astudzo, yev reman as fads pargatsav, yev budgets irenka selovor, eight serun to worry kept dosen yeladzer, Karasundari nerbidi shirchin anabadin mench pinchevorat serun to Mahana, yev hachortok serun to never hostatial yer gira bidi madne. When I'm in Karasun Dariner, Arabadi met Churchill at Turin Pamacher and Shust. Shatma Tishvaruch Nero, Hanti Betsan, Inchvest Tishnami Nero, Hanti Betsan, Voronset Betger Gervain, Adener Churigam Geraguri Bagasgar Pites, as was Misht Inchvor Betgunein, Irens High Tites. Yev Gansatarnank were Shat Hedak Kragan, Tech Mabada Hetsav, Irens Garta Masor Masin. Եվ դեսնենք թե ինչ է ասուր նշանակությունը։ Պիտի գարտամ թվոց կիրքին կսան մեկերորդ կլուխը չորորդ համարեն սկսելով գսե։ Եթով մի երգրին պոլոր դիկեն անցնելով, հովր լերնեն գարմիր ձովուն ճամպան չվեցին ու ճամպուն մեջ � Kanzi hat chiga chu chigea was chinchin hats in mer sirda zes vere. Usti dera jovurtin vara gizog, I think on tunavor ot serger gets, borong hadzin jovurta, ein best for Israelen, shad jovurt merav. Jovurta mov se sin ye gav, u a sin, dero chutem, u kezi tem hoselov, meran chetzink. A hot gere derocha, որ մեր վրայն ոցերը վերցն է։ Մովսես ժողովուրդին համար աղաչեց։ Եվ դերը ասավ Մովսեսին, կեզի գիզող ոց մշին է ու զանիկա ծողիմը վրաթիր, ով որ ոցեն խածվի անոր թողնայի և աբրի։ Եվ Մովսես բ ոց մը մարդ մը խածներ ու մարդը բղենց է ոցին նայեր, անմիջաբես կարող չանար։ Կդեսնենք, որ այս ժողովորդը մեղ կործեցին։ Եվ կանի որ թե ասուզո թեմ և թե մովսեսին թեմ խոսեցան, կանկադեցան, չի վստահեցան Եվ կանկադեցան, նույնիսկ ասուծո պարիկներուն նգատմամբ կանկադեցան և ասված բատջելու համար իրենց թունավոր ոցեր գրգեց որպեսի խայթեն և ան, որ գխայթվեր գմերներ։ Եվ աս մեզի գծուցն է, որ մեղկին վարց գմահ է և որ մեգը մեղ կործ է անոր եդինգը, անոր հետևանքը, որ մահն է ասուզմ է պաժանում է։ Բայց կդեսնենք, որ ասված այդ գերբով չի բահեց իրենք, կանի որ և որ մովսես աղոթեց աստուծո, կանի որ իր ժողովուրդը գսիրեր և կիտեր, որ ասված ադ իր ժողովուրդը գսիրեր, ուրեմ են խնդրեց, որ ասված լուծում ոցերն էին և ահավասիկ ինքը ոց մբիտիշին է և անշուշտ այսօր մենք կիտենք, որ այդ ոցը գներգայացն է Քրիստոսը։ Արդեն հովաննու երորդ կլխունդասնչորորդ համարի մեջ կգարթանք, որ Հիսուս ինքը սա վինչպես Եվ որ այդ բղինց է ոցին նային։ Թերև ժողովորդը նույնիս չէ հասկծան, թե ինչու և ինչպես պիտի թարմանվեին, բայց կիտսան, որ 
թարմանում են մի ակցևը այդ օցի նայիլն է պետք է հավատային որ այդ օցը զիրենք պիտի փրգե եւ ասեւով պիտի թարմանվին եւ քիցան որ ասիկա ցրի բարքեւ մնե փամը բեկչուն էին անելու բարձրապես պետք է նայեին բարձրապես պետք է հավատային եւ հետա քրական մասը այդ է որ թարմանումը անմիջական էր ասված մեզ գամած գամած չի ներեր օրմը այս մեղքը հաչորդ օրը մյուս մեղքը հապա եւ որ մենք թարցի գուք անք մեր մեղքերուն համար մեր փոլոր մեղքերը մեկ անգամ են գներվին ամփոխչովին գներվին եւ գտեսնենք որ այս թարմանումը փոլորին համար է ան որ այս օցին գնայեր կթարմանվեր ուրիշ կերպը չի գար ուրիշ ցև չի գար փրգվելու մի այն մի ակցևը օցին նայելն էր եւ այսօր գահարցնենք արջոք ինչպես մարտիկ քիդեն որ այս ճշմարիտն է ինչպես այդ ժողովուրդը քիցա որ այդ է ճշմարտությունը եթե նային պիտի փրգվին ուրեմն երկու կարևոր փաներ գտեսնենք ոս առաջինը պետք է ասուծո խոստումին վստահեին քանի որ ասվածը սավ ասված կարող է ասված հավադարի մե ուրեմն երբ որ գնային եւ եւ հավատան ասուծո խոստումին անդեն քիդեն որ պիտի փրգվին երկրորդ գնան իրենց չորս կողմը շուր չնայել եւ դեսնել որ ան որ գնայի այդ բղինցե օցին գփրգվի ուրեմն քիդե որ ինքն ալ եթե այդ հավատ կունենա պիտի փրգվի այսօր մենք դայրոնակ գտեսնենք գտնենք ասիկա բղինցե օցի մնայիլ եւ փրգվիլ խաչյալ հիսուսի նայիլ եւ փրգվիլ եւ ոմանք նույնիսկ գար համար են ասիկա ծաղր գնեն այսօր փոլորը սալ խայթված ենք մեղքով եւ գիտենք որ մեղքին վարձ կմահ է եւ անոր համար անոնք որոնք գիտեն այս դարբեր գերբեր գփնդրեն որբես իրենք զիրենք փրգեն ազատեն բայց ուրիշ ցևը չի գա մի ակ ցևը հիսուսի նայելն է եւ այդ է որ մարտիկ կփրգե միս փոլոր գերբերը գցախողին եւ հոս է որ գգիտնանք որ ասված մեզի մի ակ մեկ ցևը դված է անալ հիսուս ինքն է ճամփան ճշմարտությունը եւ գյանքը ուրիշ գերբը չի գա միան հիսուսի միջոցով է ուրեմն այսօր երբ կմոդենանք այս սեղանին նույն փանը գտեսնենք i want to uh, read a passage from chapter uh, luke chapter 22 where Jesus is gathered with his disciples for the last supper and we read here that says in the same way after supper sorry uh Jesus uh taking uh, the cup he gave thanks and said take this divided among you for i tell you i will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of god comes and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying this is my body given for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after the supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you and so jesus is explaining to his disciples what they are to do to remember what he was going to do on the cross that he was giving himself up for their sins for our sins and he says do this as often as you do it do it in remembrance of me and that's what we want to remember today as we look at genesis chapters 1 through 3 we see god's many blessings and how because of our sin that turned into a curse that turned into god's judgment on us and yet in spite of all that god continues to give us his grace to show us his grace in so many different pictures And so today he invites us to take part in this the Lord's Supper so that we will remember his grace a gift that we don't deserve not only remember but to rededicate ourselves to live for him to say Lord I understand my sin that has gotten in the way that has destroyed everything but I want to commit myself once again to live for you to enjoy your blessings 
And so that's what he invites us for today. But I want to caution you, if you don't have a personal relationship with God, this is not for you. If you've chosen to walk away from God and have nothing to do with God, this is not for you. This is for those who love God and put their trust in Him by demonstrating it in their everyday lives of how they live and, and commune with Him. And so God invites you today to repent of your sin, to confess if you have any known sins or if you've been holding on to something, and He will forgive. And He invites you to take part so that you will have that communion with Him and prepare for eternity. And so I want to take a moment of silence for you to thank God, for you to confess any known sins that you may have hidden in your heart that God already sees and knows. And then I'll ask you to come forward and take the elements and then we'll take it together. So let's bow our heads for a moment. Father, thank you for sending us your son, Jesus, who was sinless, but chose to take our sin upon himself and pay for it with his life so that we would have life. Thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the opportunity to remember what you did on the cross. So I pray that we would not take communion lightly, but we would once again, having confessed our sins, to dedicate ourselves to living for you, to bring glory to your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. As Ara plays on the piano, I would like you to come forward, take up the element, and go back and sit down, then I'll give you the instructions of how we're going to take it. May I ask to, for you to start from the back rows and come down the side aisle, and then move up the center aisle so that uh, we won't crowd here that together. Uh, so in the, if we start from the back rows and come down the side aisle and go back up in the center aisle, go ahead.
The bad news we ran out, the good news is we ran out. So that's okay. Marina went to get some. And so uh, when, when she gets some, uh, we'll, we'll give it to those who don't have one. While she gets those, I want to read something to you. The beginning of the passage that I read, this is what Jesus said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Mine, and if you would just give it to Rafi and Nora and Sherry. Oh, she has one. So Jesus said, I have been waiting to, to take the communion with you, and I will not eat of it until um, I do so in the kingdom of heaven. Yesterday, I had a very interesting conversation with Matt on the phone. And he was sharing with me how he longed to be with us today because this is one of his favorite times of coming together for the communion with each other and with God. And so he sent me something this morning that he also uh, has it maybe on Facebook, but I wanted to read that to you. He says, the last few days, as I've been lying in this hospital bed, unable to eat or drink, I've been thinking a lot about this passage. This final meal before his crucifixion, Jesus emphasized two points. The disciples will continue to celebrate this meal in remembrance of what's about to happen, but Jesus himself won't taste it again until the kingdom of God comes. We often take the practice of the Lord's Supper for granted, a tradition and ritual that we squeeze into our regular church routines, maybe every week, maybe once a month, maybe only a few times a year. Yet for Jesus, it was significant, something he eagerly looked forward to. The final meal with his disciples before his earthly ministry came to a close. Simple bread and wine, forever a symbol of his crucifixion and atonement for our sins. There's also the longing for the next time he'll be able to eat this meal again with his disciples and friends. We'll have the chance to eat it as often as we like, but Jesus is going to have to go without it for a while. Of course, there's no shortage of food in heaven, and we love to dream of the new tastes and sensations we will have there. And certainly a king can eat whatever he wants, but Jesus states in Matthew's account in particular that he'll be waiting to partake in it again until his disciples have joined him in heaven. Having not tasted anything all week, I think I'm having an easier time imagining what that would have felt like. I probably would have savored my food a little more last week if I knew I would be tasting things again for a while. And I certainly have a great longing to taste something again one day. Yet the taste I find myself longing for this week is our simple bread and grape juice of communion, the Lord's Supper. While I don't know when that day will be, for me it's simply waiting for this NG to be taken out at some point. We're draining my GI tract as much as we can in preparation for surgery, and also in the hopes that it will help clear up this obstruction, and I don't know how long it will take. I won't be able to taste anything again until that suffering is complete. Yet the eagerness I have for that day doesn't compare to the eagerness Jesus has for the day when all the children of God will partake in that great supper together. So let's not take the Lord's Supper lightly. It's a small little piece of heaven we get to experience here on earth 
as we look forward to the day when we all get to partake in it together. So on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it into pieces, and he gave it to his disciples so that they would take part. And he said, take, eat in remembrance of me. So let us take the bread and eat it in remembrance of him. In the same way Jesus took the cup after supper, and he says, this is the new covenant, which means that you don't have to work for your salvation, that it is a gift from God. And so let us value that gift that God gives us. It's free to us, but it cost him his life. And so in this cup, we see his life giving us life to live for him. So as you take of that cup of the wine, the grape juice, remember him. And on your way out, you can take your cups with you and drop it in the trash can that's back there. Our Father in heaven, we want to thank you once again for this gift, gift of life, gift of salvation, and your gift of grace. Help us not to see it as cheap grace as we live for you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us all stand and, ling and sing um, Amazing Grace, How Sweet This Sound. Two verses. Christos ish nor cast zo sera ye supok vin hartak chuna ser amen had the lahima u havidian. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be merciful to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace and enjoy the gifts that God gives us. Amen.